Okay, now uh, 846. Good morning. I know for Eastern East Coast people almost lunch time. So you just had a brunch, good brunch. Uh, my name is Ji Hyun Lee and I'm a professor of biostatistics at the University of New Mexico and also I'm current president of the Caucus for Women in Statistics. <laughs> this is a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce Ms. Jerry Mulro. <laughs> so I'm Korean and Korean we don't have a clear pronunciation for the L and R. So we say you know, I'm eating every morning steamed rice, <laughs> yeah, something like that. So L and R. So I'm a little bit having a hard time to pronounce Miss Mulo, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so um, she is currently acting uh, director of the Bureau of Justice Statistics (BJS) and the principal federal statistical agency within the Department of Justice. She has 30 years of experience as applied statistician working in government, industry, and academia with over 20 years of, so this is a technical problem. <laughs> Uh, in the federal statistical system overseeing national surveys and administrative data collections. Ms. Moreau has a Master of Science in Statistics from the Colorado State University and a Bachelor of Science in the Mathematics from Montana State University. Ms. Moreau has been a member of the ASA, uh, ASA and graduate, since graduate school is the ASA Fellow and a past Vice President over ASA. Please join me to welcome Ms. Mello. Good morning. Uh, can, is that too loud and not loud enough? Okay? It's okay. So, okay. okay. This is always the most challenging part. Getting your slides up. Yes. Again, we cannot see the, uh, the mouse key. of my name all sorts of different ways and I still answer to it, so it's fine, whatever. <laughs> no, I'm Jerry Mulrow. Um, as, uh, as I was introduced, I'm the Acting Director for the Bureau of Justice Statistics um, and I'm an ASA Fellow. Um, so I wanted to first uh, thank the organizers for having me here. Um, I think this is a great conference. This is my first time here. It's really exciting to see all of the faces out in the audience what do you back in the back of the room? Um, but I think it's great. I hear that there's like uh, 400 attendees here at this conference, and it's a great opportunity uh, to network and get to uh, meet with people that you already know, and then maybe meet some other people that you don't know, and hear some things about uh, things that are not necessarily technical in nature, but a little bit more broadly uh, and leadership kinds of things. So um, I was asked to talk about statistical leadership in the federal government. So. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, start out um, by talking a little bit about what some of those core competencies are, uh, just to give you an idea. And as I go through those, I hope you'll be thinking about how you can get some experiences in these areas. Uh, then I want to talk about how I actually gained experiences in those areas and how I got to be where I am today uh, and that path that I took. Um, and I'll uh, have a few little lessons learned, not too many on that. And then if I have some time, I thought I would um, give you a little bit of an overview of what I'm currently doing at the Bureau of Justice Statistics. So that's kind of the scope of where we are today. Um, I, unlike uh, my predecessor, really, I have paper, so because <laughs> I'm very not good at some of that. Um, so okay, so I wanted to start out with these core competencies. So. 
Um, I'm what's considered to be a senior executive um, in the federal statistical, or in the, in the federal government. Um, I happen to work for a federal statistical agency. Um, and there are five core competencies that the federal government requires of people in leadership roles. And so I thought I'd start with these because when I think about these, I actually think they're applicable to any kind of a leader in any type of an organization. That these kinds of skills that you might need to run the government or run an organization or run a project, all of these things kind of come together. So I want to talk a little bit about those at the beginning and then I'll tell you about how I kind of came to get some of these experiences and these skills. So uh, leading change is one of them. Leading people, which I think is more the traditional kind of thinking that people think about when they, they talk about leadership. Um, it's being results driven, so getting things done. Um, it's uh, having some business acumen, um, managing things well, knowing where you are, what's happening outside of your realm, um, and building coalitions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those. And again, um, I think uh, leadership is actually something that you, it, it doesn't necessarily come to you naturally, it's something that you gain and learn over time through experiences. And so thinking about how some of the things that you're doing or some of the things that you could be doing to gain some of these experiences in these areas as I'm talking about it, I think would be helpful as we go forward. And then I'll talk about my path. So um, leading change. Um, this is the ability to bring about strategic change in your organization. So I think that's kind of a natural fit for people in our field in um, statistics and data science. We're always thinking about improving things, making things more efficient, more effective. And part of that is bringing about change. So that piece of it, I think I've spent a lot of my career actually in this area about leading change in organizations that I've been at. Um, some of the things that they say you need to be able to lead change is be creative and innovative and flexible. I think that fits within our fields pretty well. We think about things that way. It's about resilience. Resilience is really about bouncing back from things. So when you do a, an experiment or you're in research, you know it's not always going to work, right? So you step, take a step back, you look at the results, and you move in another direction. That's really what resilience is about in a more broader sense. Looking at what happened, if it didn't go so well, why not? Move on, figure out how to do it. So that resilience, that helps to lead change because we have to be able to be uh, fail and then move forward on things. Um, and then the last three things, external awareness, strategic thinking, and vision, those are things I actually learned more through the experiences about how to think that way on things. Because I started out as more, sort of more smaller on projects and then it got a little bit bigger, so I'll talk about that. Leading people, again, this is where I think traditionally people think about leadership, it's really about people, and it is about people. It's about um, getting people to um, move the organization towards its vision, mission, and goal. Um, but that's only a piece of it, so that's one of the five components. Um, I have to say that for me, this is the um, most um, confusing <laughs> piece of things, or maybe the most, um, challenging part of it, uh, and it's also been, uh, uh, in, later in my career, the most rewarding part of it. Um, and I think coming from a mathematics and statistics background, which was very, I kind of went into the field that way because I liked the um, containment of things. I liked that numbers always added up the same way, and, it, and there wasn't a lot of messiness about it. But as we know, people are a little messy, so this part of it, is a piece that's kind of challenging for me. Um, but uh, I think I've learned some things and I continue to learn about how to lead people. Uh, this requires things like um, working with different types of people who are who not only do they look different, but they think differently, they come from different backgrounds, um, trying to build teams of people so that they work together, so that there, uh, there's a synergy there, that there's good um, ideas flowing forward. Um, a big piece of it for me that I like is developing others. Uh, this aspect of it. Um, it's getting the uh, skills and development for other people so that they can succeed in what they're doing. And so that's the rewarding part to me about leading people. And then there's a conflict management, which nobody likes, but that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, 
so being results driven, um, another part of leadership is actually uh, having the ability to get things done, to get other people to get things done. Um, this is part of where we want to go. It's, it's part of science, you want to move your field forward. It's part of business where you're moving forward with your organization and your company to do things that, that they want to do to get, get projects done. It's part of the government where we want to continue they say we know, but we do. We try to move things forward even in the government. Uh, so what does that take? Well, here's where my technical skills have really come into play. So problem solving and technical capability, those are areas that help you to get things done. You know, you've got a, an issue, you look at it, um, solve it, and move forward. The business side of that comes in and looking at the customer service and the entrepreneurship that you might do if you're in a business field, uh, you want to drive towards getting things so that the customers are happy and that helps to drive your business forward. Um, decisiveness, being able to make decisions, that's an important piece of leadership actually. People need to, um, leaders do need to make decisions um, and then they also need to know when they need to reverse those decisions or change those decisions. But not making a decision is worse than making a decision and then having to adjust. Because if you make a decision, you're doing something and then you're moving forward. And it might be that it's not quite the direction that you meant it to be. So then you have to readjust. But if you don't make a decision, you sort of stay in place. So decision decisiveness is another aspect. And accountability, holding yourself accountable and being able to hold others accountable. Uh, the fourth piece, business acumen. Um, to me, it's the government kind of just finds it this way, which I, I find to be very dry. But this is actually a very rich area, business acumen. It's about the big picture. Where do you fit in, and how do you use the resources that you have well? Your financial resources, your people resources, and your technology resources. I could talk a whole hour on this one, but I won't. But because it doesn't come across in this one, but that's okay, we'll move forward. Um, and the last one is building coalitions. So um, things don't really happen in a vacuum. I mean, they happen in the space of what everything else is going on, and they happen when other people are involved. So um, for a leader, um, knowing when to develop partnerships, um, when to build those coalitions, and with whom, um, and how it helps you to move forward. So it's not just within your own group, might be with the teammate, but it's also with outside organizations. So one of the really cool things that um, when I first came to BJS that, was that, that drew me to the Bureau of Justice Statistics was they were just starting out on this very large project with, to work with the um, FBI on helping to improve crime statistics for the nation. And so we have developed a really nice working coalition uh, with the FBI to help them um, to get law enforcement agencies to report what's called uh, national incident-based reporting, which will give us a much finer grained set of data on crimes being reported to law enforcement. Who's reporting them, what kind of crime, what the offenders are doing, much more detail. Uh, so it's very exciting to have that coalition. So I'm going to stop uh, talking about these and I'm going to start talking a little bit about how my path to getting some of these experiences came about. So I have to say that <laughs> it definitely was not a linear path <laughs> for me. Um, it was more of a, uh, I think when I look back on it, it was really more, I was really always more interested in working on the challenging problem, working on the interesting solutions. Um, and along the way, because I would uh, volunteer to work on projects or volunteer to work on outside activities, I started to gain some of these experiences and um, uh, skills that I didn't even realize were helping me to advance forward in my career on things. But because I always wanted to work on that exciting project. And I uh, feel lucky that I've been able to do that. So definitely wasn't for me. Um, straightforward and I, I didn't have a, a goal, a plan to do this or that or whatever. What I had a goal in mind was to look pretty well and do things that I liked. And so I think I've been, in that sense, I think I've been successful. Because I still like what I'm doing. 
Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, so Julie said that, uh, yes, I have a bachelor's degree uh, in mathematics from Montana State University. Um, at that time, they didn't have um, statistics, separate statistics degree or data, data science degree or anything like that. Uh, they did have a few statisticians, um, but I started out, I really actually started out as a chemical engineer and I lasted about six months in that particular program. <laughs> Decided, no, I, what I really like is the math side of things. So I switched into a math degree and in my junior year of uh, taking uh, math courses, my advisor said, I think you really ought to take some um, applied kinds of courses. And I'm like, why? He's like, no, really, really. You, to, <laughs> you really ought to take some applied things. So I, I took some computer science courses. Um, I took an accounting course, which I did not last in. I, I, took, the, <laughs> I took four. I think I lasted like four weeks. I said, no, this is, this is really not for me. And, and I took the first statistics course, and I said, hmm, I don't know. You know, that first statistics course back in the early 80s, that was really not a great course. And I, I, I actually turned my book back in. I said, no. That is, that, I, no, I'm not going to do statistics. That's just not for me. And he's like, no, really? you got to try some other things. So he, um, there was a, um, a course at Montana State at that time that was sort of a, it was a three-week session on regression and then a three weeks on analysis of variance and another three weeks on design and experiments. Yeah. Um, and I took that course. And by the end of that course, I went, wow, there's so much more to statistics. I think this would be really interesting. And uh, so that got me hooked. Um, I, I figured out that uh, statistics was a great uh, area for me to uh, feel, feed that need to do problem solving kinds of things and to have challenges. And the other piece of it that I really liked and I've heard from other people is that what statistics allowed me to do was work in a variety of different fields. So I didn't have to say, oh, I'm just going to work in biology or just work in chemistry or, or work in justice or something like that. So statistics to me uh, was very broad and allowed me that uh, opportunity to kind of fulfill that um, interest in me to do different things. So I went to, um, uh, I applied, uh, got into uh, graduate school at Colorado State University. Uh, I met my husband there. Uh, some of you may know him. Uh, his name is Ed Mulrow. He's also a statistician um, and a fellow of the American Statistical Association. But I met him there in graduate school. Um, so you'll see that uh, sometimes my career has uh, dovetailed with his career because we're a dual career. Uh, couple and that's had some ramifications on the way we've made decisions throughout our process and our lives um, but overall what we tried to do is make it pretty good for both of us maybe not optimal for either one of us but overall pretty good for both of us um, so I uh, passed the qualifiers uh, at Colorado State but I really my heart was really not in it I really didn't want to get a PhD and so I um, said no this is really not for me I think I would like to be an applied statistician. So my first job, uh, after I got my master's degree, after I completed the qualifiers and all that hard work of doing all that, um, I got a position at the National Institute for Standards and Technology. So this was my first uh, federal job. And I uh, worked at Boulder, Colorado, there in the Statistical Engineering Division. And it was a great uh, job. I thought, oh my god, this is the best job I'm ever going to have. <laughs> and it was a great job. But they've all been they've all been really interesting jobs that I've had. Um, so I worked there for a couple of years while my husband finished up his uh, PhD in statistics. And when he finished it up, then he got an assistant professorship at Southern Illinois University. So I moved with him to Southern Illinois University and got a position as a lecturer because that was all that I could get uh, with my master's degree. And so I taught um, undergraduate level math and statistics courses, and this is when I really decided that I was not cut out for teaching. That this was <laughs> just after the fourth class and the fourth time I said it, and the fourth time they didn't really get it. <laughs> those are those low level undergraduate courses. I just thought this is this is not for me. I don't I don't mind uh, doing like short courses or something like that, but the the day in and day out, I admire people who do that and like that. So I think that's great. But it wasn't it wasn't for me. Um, so I, I convinced my husband that, that we should move, and this was a big thing because you know he was on the track for you know he was assistant professor. That he always thought he was going to be a professor somewhere, um, but 
we agreed that we would move to, a, to an area where uh, we both would have more opportunities. So there were really no bigger opportunities for me in Southern Illinois. At Southern Illinois University, that's Carbondale, Illinois. It's, um, you know, I, and I didn't want to be a part. We didn't necessarily want to be a part. So we got, um, we applied for and got jobs in the Washington, D.C. area. So my first job in the Washington, D.C. area was for the Internal Revenue Service at the Statistics of Income Division. So this is my second federal, federal agency and my first uh, statistical agency, federal statistical agency. Um, and I worked for a great guy there uh, named Fritz Schoen, who maybe some of you might know of. He's a past president of the United States. Not the United States. <laughs> 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 I wish. <laughs> of the USA. <laughs> that was a slip. Sorry about that. Um, and then I was a president. It was more like going back. <laughs> So I worked there for uh, eight years, which I, I enjoyed. I um, actually had uh, my daughter before we moved there, and uh, Fritz was uh, great enough to let me work uh, part-time. So I actually worked 80% of the time. I worked four days a week, eight-hour days. So I, I actually felt very lucky to be able to have a supportive um, supervisor who would allow me to have some time with my kids and yet still have time on my career. I, I thank him for that because that was a kind of a new thing back then to let people do that kind of work, and that was great. Uh, but we, we uh, got kind of tired of living in the D.C. area, and we decided that we would um, move to Chicago, which is where my husband's from. So we, got, uh, we both got jobs um, at the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, and we worked there for a couple of years. Um, but again, I'm always the problem one. Uh, this was just a little too close to my in-laws. It was just... <laughs> Uh, it was great, and it was. I learned a ton. I worked with Kirk Walter, a variance estimation drilled into my head. So I got that. It was a great experience. Uh, but we came back, and we said, I said, you know, I think for me, Washington, D.C. is a great place for me as a woman. And the federal government, or something around the federal government, is a good uh, place for me. But again, Fritz Schoen had an opportunity. He was starting up a statistics group at Ernst & Young, which is now called EY. Ernst Young is a large accounting firm, um, and they were starting up a um, quantitative analysis, or, uh, economics and quantitative data analysis, or something in statistics. Statistics was at the end. Um, uh, so that was really interesting. Um, that was my first for profit organization, and um, there were some really interesting lessons that I learned to work there. Um, and I'll talk about those, especially around the business acumen side of things and the budgeting piece of it. chapter and then when I moved to uh, Washington DC I got really involved with the Washington Statistical Society which is their local chapter um, and started doing things there then I got involved at the national level on a variety of different committees over time working on various different things that's been um, interesting I got uh, on the council of sections governing board and was a vice chair there and then moved up and they um, asked I got to be a representative for the Council of Sections on the um, Board of Directors. I worked with Sally Morton at that time, which was great. So Sally's here as a former President of the United States. <laughs> 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 um, and then they asked me to run as Vice President. I liked it so much. I had such a great time on the ASA Board. Um, they asked me to run as a Vice President, so I ran as a Vice President. I just finished up the term there. Um, and then I'll be running for President coming up. So. I don't know, I can't get enough of ASA. It's been a great organization for me uh, and helped me throughout my career. So, so those seems like, you know, they're kind of separate stuff going on, but actually uh, it's all woven together. Okay, so my path. Here's my path. And I think, I think this is not necessarily atypical of people. We start out, we're in a technical career, we focus on our technical expertise. You start out, you're, you get your degree, and for the first probably 10 years of my career, I really focused on the technical side of things. Uh, this is where I was working as a statistician, you know, running programs, designing experiments, doing modeling, all the types of things that, that we do, you know, thinking about how to structure data, which is 
which we didn't call it data science at that time, but we, we did have large data sets that we had to organize and figure out how to manipulate and use, and uh, we didn't have the big data techniques. Relatively large data at IRS to work on. Um, so, you know, I worked on developing my skills pretty much that first part of my career, and that was my work focus. But at the same time, I was actually volunteering through these ASA um, activities. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about those activities because those are where I really started to get at some of these experiences that help about leading, I think, leadership. That's where I feel like at the first part of my career I got more of those types of experiences. So when I was uh, volunteering for the Washington Statistical Society, WSS, I was actually on the short course committee and the social chair committee. Um, and the way it worked was I didn't get a budget to do these events. They just said, go plan the events and don't lose money. So you're like, so how much money can I spend? They're like, that depends <laughs> on, <laughs> on you. <laughs> You know, you don't have a budget. So I ha we, we had to formulate, we had to figure out how did we figure out how many people are we going to have, who are we going to have talk to these things, are we going to give people um, food, and then will they pay the price for food, and how to, how to start thinking about all of those kind of budgeting and balancing things. And I was lucky because I worked with somebody who had some experience in that, so I actually didn't have to just figure it all out myself. I was actually working with other people who'd had that experience. But that, um, that short course, uh, social chair committee, helped me to start thinking about what it meant to be fiscally responsible. I didn't want to lose money for the WSS because I knew that's a volunteer organization. We're getting you know minimal dues from our people, but we want to put on nice events. So that helped me to start thinking about some of that uh, <laughs> aspect of it. And I have to say that that was actually a good foundation for when I went to Ernst & Young. Um, which was the for-profit organization because at that point in time I just got thrown into it. They were like, here's a project, uh, tell me how much, you know, what you think it's going to take to finish this project um, and that's what we'll bill out to the client and uh, go. So um, that was that was an experience. I would have to say that I was, uh, even though I'd had the WSX experience and I thought about it, um, so I kind of had a a, a sort of foundation for how to develop a budget. But I have to say, the first time that uh, my project came in way over budget, uh, my um, supervisor was like, well, you're just going to have to go and talk to the client and tell them why you are over budget and you can't finish the project for the amount of money. Boy, was that the most uncomfortable. Oh my gosh. That was, that was really, that was rather uncomfortable. Um, I bumbled through it. The client didn't pay all of it. My my supervisor, my partner, had to pick up that was pick up uh, the rest of the uh, cost for that project. But I learned. I did learn. <laughs> I did learn. What I what I so I stopped and I thought, what is it? Why is it that I, you know, I knew I could do that project in 24 hours or whatever it was that it took. But what I didn't take into account, and we all know, is that there are always data issues. There's always data cleaning, data file, data organization, data storage, data issues that I just wasn't budgeting for in that project. And I had to budget for those kinds of things going forward. And that has been helpful to think about not just the piece that I was doing, but that where does that fit into the bigger project of things. So now I'm starting to see not just where my work is and what it's doing, but the impact on the other parts of the processing that I don't always have control over. So I'm thinking a little bit broader there. So I'm getting some of those things uh, that are those experiences. And fortunately, I mean, yes, I've had some uncomfortable kinds of uh, experiences, but I've had people who have been supportive and have helped me throughout. So I didn't feel like I just totally hit bottom and no one was there to help me come up. But it, it wasn't always comfortable, I have to say. It wasn't. Um, and then, uh, so leading people and building coalitions, these other two aspects. ASA uh, activities have really helped me, really helped me in my middle part of my career to gain some of the experiences in that. Um, you know, as a vice chair and a chair, your role is to really help move the work of that committee forward and to get the other volunteers on the committee to work with you to get towards that goal. Well, now, we are all 
when you're volunteering to be on these things, you're all interested in that work, but you may not all be moving in the same direction. So this is where I started to learn about um, leading volunteers when you don't have any control, span of control. So it's, it's more of an influencing and negotiating aspect of things and working with people. So it's a give and take kind of thing to uh, move an organization where you don't have control over the specific direction to get it to move in that direction. So I sort of adopted this, uh, this um, lead, follow, or get out of the way kind of <laughs> attitude. Sometimes I would lead to say, hey, here's the way I think we should do it, and then people would follow, and sometimes somebody else would jump up with a great idea and say, yeah, let's do that. So then we're following. And sometimes, you know, if it's just something that you, somebody is really anxious to do, you just sort of say, step aside and let them, you know, let them move the project forward. It's okay. You know, so, but learning all those things, I think, really uh, through the ASA activities on the uh, Council of Governing Boards and on the Board of Directors and all that, those those really help me to learn about those kind of aspects and to think about how to lead people and building coalitions too, so at the smaller levels and at the broader levels. And then my work experience has helped dovetail with that kind of throughout the process to help me get to things. So, um, so putting it all together, I would have to say that throughout, um, I, I want to talk about um, continuing education because throughout my career, uh, I've, I've continued to always learn. So I always feel, even in my role now as acting director, I'm continuing to learn. I'm continuing to strive to be better at whatever it is. If it's leading people, or leading the organization, or conflict management, or what's the newest thing out there, or a whole criminal justice field. Um, so I've, I've been, um, and always have been an advocate for continuing education throughout. So um, formal, formal courses, short courses, things like this is a great opportunity for some of that. Um, other areas at ASA, where um, at JSM, if they have a short course, uh, through your local chapters, um, through your local other associations that if you're not, if you're working with a field that's not just statistics, go to those courses and conferences and learn about that field. That's part of the continuing education. Um, and read, read, read. Continue to read. More than, I, always, I never feel like I have enough time to read. So um, I would be remiss if I didn't really talk about the role of uh, mentors and advisors and role models because these have actually also played into uh, my experiences and my thinking and my decisions. So as I started out, you know, you have an advisor um, in, in graduate school and they, their role is to really help you to get to that next job, right? They're, they're trying, so that's the, kind of their job. I, I look at them as a little bit different than mentors. Mentors, to me, it's a, it's a two-way personal connection where, um, you know, I'm working with someone for their benefit and they're also working with me and helping me for my benefit. So I've had some really nice uh, mentors along the way, for sure. And as I mentioned, is one of them, Linda Carlson, who I worked with at NSF, is another one. They really took an active uh, interest in my career and helped me to think about what kinds of experiences would I need and helped me to get some of those things. So um, that's been a that's been very nice. And I would say they've been accidental in more than a sign, in the sense that we've sort of found each other in that sense uh, through more casual meetings. That's worked better for me. Um, I think the mentoring can, you can assign a mentor, but I think that's, unless there's that really personal connection, to me that's more of an advisory role. So I don't know, that's the way I, I kind of look at things. And I want to mention role models, which really I talked about a whole lot, but actually it played, um, played a big part of why I've been part of the federal statistical system. Um, when I first came to Washington, D.C. Uh, in the mid to late 80s, there were actually quite a few women in very high level roles in the statistical field, the federal statistical system. Um, so the um, U.S. chief statistician uh, was a woman, Catherine Wallman, and now the new uh, chief statistician is also a woman, Nancy Potok. Um, Janet Norwood was a commissioner of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Cynthia Clark was at the National Academies, uh, the National Agricultural Statistics Service. Um, 
there, there have been, um, uh, Barbara Baylor was at the census, she was head of the decennial census at that time, that was an interesting piece of it. There have been so many women uh, leaders in the federal statistical system that I saw that there was uh, possibly an opportunity, not just maybe to be the leader, but at least to move up in the ranks. So it gave me that sort of um, hope, I guess, to say, hey, other people have, other women have succeeded, other, um, and it's pretty balanced uh, in the statistical system for women and men. It's a, it's a little, I mean, it changes up and down. Uh, but when I first um, got to BJS, there are 13 principal federal statistical agencies, and I would say six of the leaders were women at that point in time. So that was a pretty good, it's, it's changing right now, but that's, that's the way it's going to be. So, uh, so yeah, I think um, for me it was, I started out and it was really about me and my projects and what I was doing. And then I kind of branched out to, okay, it's my team, what's my team doing? How does my team fit in? And then where are we in the organization? Where are we with our peers? And now where are we within the rest of the field and the organization? So it's kind of, I kind of grew those circles outward as I went through my career stages. Um, some of it was focused more on others. So, so I would say it definitely was um, not uh, planned, but more accidental for me to get to this position. Um, I've had, I've always had a, a great, I've always really liked what I've done. And when I haven't liked it, then I look for other things that I, I want to do that um, look fun. Um, but I'm always, I was always looking for the challenging problems, and I never wanted to say no to some of those things, even though the answer wasn't always apparent for what it was. I, I, I liked that challenge to work on that. And I always wanted to work on things that I thought would help um, move that, my organization forward. What was it that somebody didn't want to work on, but that would be helpful to making that change? And so I, I think that was just my natural gravitation to it. But I think that's kind of natural for a lot of people in our, in our field to do those kinds of things. So there I'm at the, uh, some of my lessons <laughs> that I would uh, hope to give to you. So uh, um, stop and smell the roses. So along the way, um, you know, we get caught up in, in where we're going and what we're doing in our careers and things like that. But sometimes we, we should stop and enjoy what's going on around us. Stop and smell those roses. Stop and look outside and take a walk or run that marathon or whatever it is that you do that you enjoy that's not that helps you that helps it feeds your brain it feeds your soul it, it just it's nice you're part of a broader environment take advantage of that stop and smell those roses um take stock in small successes i think we get mired in oh i didn't i didn't do all the things on my list today you know list and I only checked off two of them, darn it. Um, but, but we do, we, we should take stock in those small things because those small things help us to get to the larger things. I mean, if you're running a marathon, you know, you're not thinking about all 26 miles that you're thinking about one step at, at a time, or if you're taking a long hike, or you're biking, or you're swimming, or whatever it is that you're doing, it's, those, it's just the small successes along the way that get you there. So, so don't, uh, don't forget to celebrate those. That's important. Um, yeah, keep your eye on the prize, right? But, but that's okay. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's that nice shiny prize off in the future. It's good to have a vision of where you want to be. Um, but also don't be afraid to maybe take a little bit of a detour along the way. So maybe this doesn't get you directly from A to B, but maybe the experience that you get from going from A to C before you get to B might be helpful. Um, and that's, that's something um, I think is hard to try sometimes to try something new. Um, maybe it good, turns out well, and maybe it doesn't. But again, this is where you can adjust. You have a choice. You can go back. You can think about things. So it's kind of a risk level thing, but stretch yourself just a little bit. Uh, so Fritz used to say, be bold, be bold, but not too bold. And that's kind of how, how do you feel? You know? is it, can you take that next step? And how big is that next step? But take the next step. Take it and do something. Find the balance that fits you. Be you, be genuine. Don't try to be someone else. So you can have role models, you can have mentors, but you're not going to be in their mold. You are who you are, 
be who you are and embrace that. So, so this is where I would normally stop and take questions on some of these things, but um, we don't have a mic, and, but I did want to tell you a little bit about what I do at the Bureau of Justice Statistics, if you don't mind, because I, I find it totally fascinating. So, um, and hopefully maybe I'll get some of you to want to work in the federal government. But. <laughs> so, uh, the federal statistical system, um, can I, should I pause for a minute? People think. <laughs> uh, this is, it's really a disaggregated system. Um, there are uh, statistical agencies across the federal statistical, uh, across the agencies, across the federal government. So I'm going to stop. There are <laughs> statistical agencies within larger federal government agencies that focus on producing national statistics or federal statistics. And those are called um, statistical agencies. And there are 13 designated principal statistical agencies. And the Bureau of Justice Statistics is one of them. Um, statistics of Income Division is another. The Census Bureau, which most of you know about probably, is, is probably the best known one of those. Um, and they're coordinated by the Office of Management and Budget and by the U.S. Chief Statistician. So our role um, at the Bureau of Justice Statistics is to collect, analyze, and disseminate statistical information on crime. So we look at crimes committed, uh, victimization, crimes reported to law enforcement, uh, crimes not reported to law enforcement, why they weren't reported, what were the characteristics of those crimes. So we have a whole suite of data on victimization. Uh, we talk about law enforcement and our, our data collections are meant to be complementary to the FBI's. So the FBI collects data on actual numbers of crimes and we help them to do that, but we collect data on what are law enforcement agencies, what are their practices and policies and how are they actually supporting uh, their officers, how many officers do they have, what's the infrastructure going on, so it's complementary data collections. Uh, we talk about uh, data on the court system, so people get, uh, get arrested from law enforcement and then they go into the courts and we try to measure what's going on there. Uh, then if they get convicted, they go to uh, the correctional uh, part of the system which is going to prison or jail, so we have uh, data collections on people in prisons and jails and how many of those there are and what's happening to them in, in the jails. Uh, and then we look at uh, studies about people who get out of jail um, and do they come back and what are their, um, what are the risks for them to come back into jail or what are the things that support them. Um, so I usually show this uh, little crime funnel but I'm not going to talk about that today. I just thought I'd throw up some of the statistics that we have just so you can see some of the national statistics. So um, this is from our National Crime Victimization Survey. Um, Based on our data, we see that um, less than 1% of people under um, age of 12 or older actually experience um, a violent victimization. So that's like um, a rape or sexual assault or an aggravated assault or something like that. So it's a really a, it's a violent crime. Um, so that's a small percentage of our population, but that doesn't mean it's minimal, right? I mean, that's not good. 47% uh, of these, um, only 47% of these violent victimizations are reported to police. So a lot of crime actually goes unreported to police. And what we do is we try to capture why. And we notice that this is different depending on the type of crime that actually is being committed. So most motor vehicle theft is reported, probably because you have to report because you get your insurance money, right? But um, our estimates are only like a third of rape and sexual assault, and that might even be low, actually, are reported. It's probably less than that's probably lower. Um, over nine, only 9% nine of the uh, vi violent victimizations, uh, folks who are violently victimized receive assistance for a crime. So we have a big, um, we work a lot with the victim service providers to talk about people who have services for, that they've suffered a crime. Uh, so like the Las Vegas event, uh, and people uh, experience that. Um, there are uh, services that can help people who have gone through those kind of experiences, and we're trying to work with them to make sure that there are enough of these services out there. Where are they located? What types of uh, services are they providing? Um, so this is just a smattering. Uh, this is some of the information we have about law enforcement. Um, there are about a little over 12,000 local police departments and 3,000 sheriff departments across the country and 50 state police departments. So it's a very disaggregated, decentralized 
uh, system that we have in order to do law enforcement in this country. Uh, there's a little less than, in 2013, there were a little less than 500,000 sworn police officers throughout the country. Um, and then we looked at, we look at uh, what's going on in the crime labs. I think somebody was interested in forensics. So there, um, in 2014, there were 409 publicly funded crime labs, um, and they had 3.8 million forensic requests that year. So there's a lot of things going on. Uh, this is a little bit of data that we have on our courts and uh, probation statistics, prosecution statistics. Um, some data on the correctional area. Um, there are uh, fewer prisons and there are prisons, state prisons and there are jails. Um, we look at the numbers of people going in and out of prisons and jails uh, within a year. Uh, so at, um, at the year end of 2015, there are a little over 1.5 million prisoners. Um, in the in the state and uh, federal prison system, um, and there were over almost 11 million admissions to jail in that same year. So a lot of people coming into the system and going out. Um, and there were uh, about uh, a little over four and a half million people under community uh, correction. That's like probation or parole. So these are um, things that are affecting our communities. Um, these data and, and what's happening to this these set of people that are coming into the system. Um, so it's it's really quite uh, interesting to me. Um, I've kind of come around to not wanting to deal with uh, messiness of people. So this is my way of helping to uh, understand <laughs> some of what's going on. And so I feel like I've come back around. Uh, my mother was actually a probation officer when I was growing up, and I thought, oh man. So I think she, <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting that I'm now at the Bureau of Justice <laughs> measuring these things. But it's my contribution, the way that I can do it. <laughs> um, these are some of the other areas that we work in. So we, we have quite a lot of, uh, like quite a lot of interesting areas. Um, so I just, yeah, there's been quite a few. Uh, I touched on this earlier. Some of the women leaders. There's a, there was a nice article in Forbes that came out at the beginning of this year about 25. Uh, women leading data and analytics in the U.S. government. That was a nice article on there, so you can take a look at some of the women leaders going on. So that's all I have today. I guess we don't have too much time for Q&A, because um, we don't have a mic. But, um, but I will be here so I can answer questions. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank you.